Uh, Spence, can you turn that light on? I, I kind of look like I'm a dark figure in the... My hair's getting long. All right, you're ready to go. All right, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Haddon Township Equity Initiative, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Lauren Beals and I live in town and attended Haddon Township schools from preschool through 12th grade. I came back to Haddon Township with my husband to raise our two boys, ages 10 and eight, who attend Strawbridge School. Additionally, I have been teaching here for the past 15 years. Needless to say, Haddon Township schools have helped shape who I am and continue to be a huge part of my life. I am also a co-founder of the Haddon Township Equity Initiative, which is a coalition of local mothers and educators working to raise awareness of racial issues in our school district and town. As this turns out, this concern was shared by students at Haddon Township High School who circulated a petition requesting a more inclusive education in our schools. The petition was signed by 1,609 community members and inspired our panel tonight where you will hear all the reasons that their requests for a more inclusive curriculum, hiring practices, and diversity training are so very important. All these things will help prepare our kids to be thoughtful and engaged members of a diverse community and world. The conversation tonight is an important step to expanding our dialogue and understanding of how race impacts our world and our schools. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Shelley Zion from the Rowan University Center for Access, Success, and Equity, which prepares educators, students, and community members to be active participants in ending oppression through empowerment and organizing. Tonight, she will facilitate the testimonies from our current students, alumni, staff, and community members who have faced racism. We will also hear from allies who are taking action and speaking up to prevent it. During this town hall, you will hear from rising seniors, Jaden McNeely, Matt Conway, and Maya Jacobson, alumni, Hannah Fields and Lear and Tyra, community members and parents, Dory Fields, Karen McCoy, and Haddon Township teachers, Jesus Quick Castro and Barbara Matthews Bowen. Throughout tonight's event, we'll be taking questions from the public and we encourage people watching to submit questions via email to HT Equity at gmail.com. We will do our best to answer them along with the questions that have been submitted previously. We really hope that these questions and conversations will be continued at your own kitchen tables with your family, friends, neighbors, and beyond. And now I'll pass it over to Dr. Zion and our inaugural town hall, I wish you knew. Thank you and I'm so happy to know everybody's out there. I can't see y'all, but I know you're there. I wanna start with just a opening statement to kind of frame this conversation. And I think it's important for us to keep in mind that as we move into these conversations, the people who are here are really taking a very brave step. They are sharing their personal stories. And those personal stories um, create an opportunity for us to learn from them, but they also create risk that those people who are sharing those stories feel embarrassed or ashamed or talked about. So I'd like to set a few norms for the way we think about these conversations. The first is that we listen to understand. And I mean that truly listening to understand and to understand the truth of the experience that people are speaking to. I would like our second kind of understanding to be about assuming that we will be uncomfortable. When you first learn about things or hear about things they, that, that you're unaware of, there's always that moment of discomfort, that moment of maybe this isn't real, and I invite you to sit in that discomfort, but also to bite your tongue and not say that out loud because we don't want to negate or minimize the stories of people who are willing to share their experience. And then the final thing is even as we move into conversations and questions that we need to maintain a focus on the impact of what has happened rather than the intent, right? Too often, I think, in our efforts to assume that people are nice and well-meaning and kind, we focus on the intent of the person who caused harm rather than on the harm caused to the person who experienced it. And so that's kind of my overview for the way to engage in these conversations. Listen for understanding, assume that you will be uncomfortable and be willing to sit with that and focus on the impact of what, 
you're hearing rather than the intent. We will take questions after the panelists, but my opening frame is to say this. We are not here because something new is happening. We are here because events that have continued to happen in the history of our country are now occurring in a sequence and a way that has attracted our focus. Particularly the context of COVID-19 has magnified our attention to these issues. But the murders of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and incidents such as those that were publicly captured on video between um, Amy and Christian Cooper are common to those of us who are part of the black or brown or people of color communities. These are not new experiences. The combination of the historical and current um, instances of interpersonal and institutional racism are just now getting the attention of a broader audience and that is powerful and it creates an opportunity. The opportunity that we have is to address and redress these issues by listening to the stories of people who are impacted by learning together and by committing to action. So with that, we're gonna start with stories, listen to the experiences, learn from those, and then maybe move into a space where we can take action to rectify the wrong. So I wanna turn this over now to Jaden as our first panelist. Each panelist will share a five minute or so story and we'll move through our list and then we'll open it up for questions. Jaden. Hi, so. <clears throat> To be a person of color in Haddon Township is to be an anomaly at its finest. When I walk through the halls of my school, I see zero teachers who bear the same skin complexion as I. I see very few students who look the same as me and even fewer who embrace their beauty for what it is. They ignore and degrade themselves to fit in with their white counterparts or they swing the other way and are then ostracized by their peers. To be a student of color in Haddon Township is to walk a fine line of being too black or not black enough. In middle school, I was often tormented with nicknames like coconut and Oreo. I looked black, but did not fit their narrative of what a black person should be. To be a black middle schooler in Hannah Township is to be told that you should be good at dancing and basketball because it's in your genes, or to have your twin brother be referred to as Coco Bear by a sixth grade teacher. To be a black child in Hannah Township is to never have any books in your fifth grade classroom that resembles you. Overall, to be a person of color in Hannah Township is to want to dilute your culture and heritage to a tolerable amount so you don't further give into the already negative narrative that most students and staff have already embedded in their minds. But just like I learned in physics class, there's always an equal opposite reaction. So to be a person of color in Hannah Township is to live in two worlds at once, to have genuine friendships and peers who want to be allies in spite of generational biases, and to attend safe schools with rigorous curriculum despite microaggressions. To be a black student in Hannah Township is to be able to talk and have your peers listen while slowly dismantling classmates already preconceived notions about black people. To be a person of color in Hannah Township teaches you strength and resilience when you need it most. Being a person of color in Hannah Township teaches you to decipher one's true intentions and self from a couple conversations. I had to learn these things out of necessity to protect myself from unsettling situations. I have learned a lot in my time here at Hannah Township and have since then grown to love it. But that does not come with that, but that does not come without me wanting to make it better. Reflection is the mirror to the future, so we must always look back and acknowledge our flaws while also moving forward in a progressive direction. Talks about races and racism should be welcomed from an early age. To teach tolerance and acceptance, we must first acknowledge the topic in question. Racism should not be a taboo subject or a derailed dinner conversation. It is present and prevalent to those who it affects. The worst form of racism stems from the institutionalized perception of certain races based on demeaning stereotypes that somehow seep into my peers' minds and my education. To combat with the internal biases some may have against people of color, we must always, we must always be actively learning, listening, and involving externally. Nothing changes until we do. I know Haddon Township can be better. I want Haddon Township to be better. I cannot wait for Haddon Township to be better. Once we create the educated and accepting environment within our schools, it will then work its way outwards to the parents and families, thus creating an educated and accepting community. Thank you. That yeah. was awesome. I'm going to switch to Maya now. And Maya, if you can. Hi, I'm Maya Jacobson. Um, what are the core things we are taught as children by our families and schools? to love, respect, and help everyone, and to speak up when we see something wrong. Sometimes these simple values are caught up in more complicated things in life and we forget about them, or worse, we choose to ignore them. 
the world would be a better place if we remembered these values. An easy way to do so would to be to walk in each other's shoes. When I'm, when I'm angry at someone or I don't understand why they are doing something, I think about their life. Why do they believe this? Why are they acting this way? Why are they being hateful? Why are they excluding people? But I can't think of any reason for someone to not want everyone to be treated kindly and to have equal opportunities in life. To be honest, I have found myself disappointed in some of my closest friends and I've realized what makes up a truly good person, courage. I know plenty of good people that I love, but not all of them have the courage to make the world a better place. It's courageous to stand up for your beliefs, but to listen to what others have to say. It's courageous to fight for issues that don't affect you. It's courageous to make your opinions clear. I realize that silence is unacceptable. I realize that posting is a great place to start and it shows support, but I needed to go bigger. I use my artistic abilities to make a statement. I design my justice stickers by thinking about the common symbols and phrases used for Black Lives Matter. I was overjoyed by the support that my sticker received with the courageous fist paired with the demanding statement of justice. I thought that raising $800 was a reach, but I was able to proudly donate $1,188 with the help of my town, family, and friends. This made me feel so fortunate to live in a place where the BLM movement got so much support. I decided on something as simple as a sticker because people could show their support by sticking them up anywhere they pleased to bring more attention. I am proud to carry my water bottles and phone case that show my support. And I, even, and I feel even better when I find a great place in public to put them, and I hope that others feel the same way. I hope that in the future, there will be more kids with the courage to take initiatives and parents who will encourage them to do so. On the other hand, I think that the courage of my peers and I scare many adults. How could a teenager do something so political? Some adults would argue that I shouldn't share my opinion because I don't do unrelated things like pay taxes or take care of a family. My opinion is that we must bring justice to millions of people. I was ashamed that there are so many people in my town and at my school who can't see that I'm a caring young woman who wants to help people, who knows this is not politics, that this is being a good American and more importantly, a good person. And I know that these adults will rub off on their children. Their children think that showing a strong political opinion is wrong or that they must have the same opinions as their parents. If you respect and love everyone and you are teaching your kids to do the same, then I don't care what you do because someone who truly does that would support the people in the world who deserve justice. Haddon Township High School can tell us to respect each other, but they have to teach us the subjects and hire the teachers and give us the resources that allow us to properly learn why people are mad and screaming for help. That is why HDHS needs to teach kids about the true history of America and give kids teachers to learn from that aren't exactly like them. As a school, we need to learn about other cultures and learn to respect them. We need to dive into the touchy subjects so that they are no longer touchy. We need to learn about the injustices of our country and since we are the generation to fix them. Changing the curriculum at Haddon Township High School will make our school more inclusive and will also teach students how to not be racist and why they shouldn't be. It's not enough to frown upon racist behavior. Students must be taught what is right and wrong. We need to learn about the appropriate language to use and why racism is still a problem in America. By teaching us this, HTHS will help make us better people and encourage kids to make changes. The students who want to help bring equity to Haddon Township, America, and even the world will, but there can be an even bigger change if the students who don't have the courage to speak out are encouraged to. Having a better curriculum and a more inclusive staff is not political or even liberal. It's a change that will benefit us all and make us better people. Making change is even harder when we live in this hateful world. Social media and politics are tearing us apart, and I know that we are better than that. I beg of you, Haddon Township, gain the courage for our younger generations, do better for oppressed groups, respect everyone, and choose love. Thank you, Maya. As a white male, I cannot speak as the subject of racism. So tonight I'm here to discuss racism I have observed. The racism I will discuss, however, is not about what we see, but rather about what we don't. Hidden or camouflaged so well, you may not even notice it at first or realize what it is. So in our small, supposedly inclusive town, what is hidden? What don't we see? The answer is simple. And if you didn't know before, you won't miss it now. Non-white, non-white students, non-white staff members, non-white culture and non-white representation. My brother is 12 years old and an African-American. He was adopted from Haiti and, frankly, stands out in a Haddon Township crowd. 
not because he's really all that different from his peers. He, like most 12-year-olds, is an energetic, fun-loving kid. But here in HT, he is easily identifiable. We often joke that we could never lose him in a crowd at a place like Crystal Lake Pool because it, he doesn't blend in very well. You can guess why. HT is 91% white. This is not surprisingly reflected in the makeup of the student body, but also in the staff and faculty. A huge majority of the teachers and administrators in HT are white or white passing. In my 12 years in this school system, I have had one teacher who was non-white. This hurts every student, especially our non-white students who don't see themselves in their role models. Numerous studies have shown that students are more likely to graduate and succeed in life if they have at least one teacher who looks like them, such as a black student having a black teacher or a Hispanic student having a Hispanic teacher. This worries me. What does this mean for my brother? How will he feel when he makes the same realization that I did, that none of his teachers look like him? What will that mean for his future and his success? Cultural representation is lacking too. I'm a rising senior and have taken three years of honors level English. In those three years, I've read two books by non-white authors, Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry and The Other West Moore by West Moore. Two books out of nearly 20 that I've read were by non-white authors. English is just one example of a lack of cultural representation. Uh, and the same occurs in all the other subjects as well. We have left our students of color high and dry. There's no representation in the staff very few peers who share their experiences and little to no cultural education. All of this causing few opportunities to relate to someone who shares their struggles, isolated on an island in the middle of a white sea. How can we claim to fight racism when we won't even discuss it or discuss the perspective of people of color on racism? How can we say we are anti-racist when we don't know the first thing about non-white culture? We can't. My brother has come home on many occasions wondering why his skin is a different color, why he has to be brown, not white, why the rest of his classmates look different from him. He, at 12, has even experienced some insensitive comments at school. Why, in our oh-so-inclusive community, has a Black child come home feeling ostracized by his skin color? Because we are not as inclusive as we think. We unintentionally and sometimes intentionally isolate people of color because they do not look like the rest of our racially homogenous town. To see the effects of this isolation on a young child, even when he was eight or nine years old, is heartbreaking. I can only imagine what it feels like to be the victim. Looking back on my time in the HT school district, I can see that the lack of diversity severely impacted my education, but I can only imagine how it affects students of color. After listening to what you will hear tonight, it is your job to think. My brother does not fully understand the racism present in our town, yet. I am certain that it will not take long for him to experience its full effects. You will hear horror stories that will make you wonder just how accepting our town really is. These stories may have occurred in the past, but know that they are not relics of it. They will happen again, and if we choose not to act, we will carry the blame. You cannot protect our current students from racism. Honestly, at this point, it's too late but it is our job to work to dismantle the policies that facilitate racism and allow students of color to feel like a true part of our community, to create a better world for future generations in which children like my brother will not have to worry about how the color of their skin sets them apart from others. Thank you, Matt. Now we're going to shift from current students to alumni, recent alumni, so I'm gonna to go to Hannah. Hello, everybody. My name is Hannah Fields, and I am an and I am sorry an alumna of Haddon Township High School, class of 2016. Let me preface my words with this message: I am not sharing these experiences for any other reason than to help educate and better this town, because I love and care about the people who live here and its future. The only way we can make positive and effective change is to go back, look at the history, relearn the truth, reckon with the past, and make sure things like this never happen again on any level. And I'm not talking about the racist acts. I'm talking about the racist lack of action. Let's make sure that never happens again. Growing up and living in this town for the past 22 years, I have a lot to say. 
and countless incidents in regards to racism from daycare through high school. Again, this is not new news, but the incident that I'm going to speak on today is one that may be familiar to some of you. And for those of you who are new, here's the backstory. I was very active in the performing arts department throughout middle school and high school. If there was a show, I was in it and I loved it. It was my safe place, my happy place. And I'd like to say I was pretty darn good at it if I do say so myself. <laughs> uh, I was the kid that was friends with everyone. You would rarely to almost never find me without a smile on my face and a positive attitude no matter what was going on in my life. My senior year of high school, we were in the midst of performing Mary Poppins the Musical, where I was cast as Mrs. Banks. We were a little over halfway through the show and my scene partner opened a prop, front and center stage, a white piece of paper, which was supposed to be a letter, instead had the N word written in big, bold, red capital letters. And yes, with the hard R. You could tell time was taken to draw this note. My scene partner, knowing that I saw it, closed the piece of paper quickly, and we went on with the rest of the scene and the show. Afterwards, I hunted down my scene partner, <laughs> and they reluctantly gave me the prop and apologized, saying they didn't write it. I was grateful that they didn't throw it away or quickly dispose of the, ed of the evidence that I finally had after all of my life being told that the microaggressions and outwardly racist things that happened to me were all in my head or didn't exist anymore. No, my experience was real and now I have the proof to show for it. I brought the prop to my director and I swear that walk with that prop in my hand felt like the longest, most silent walk in my life. I couldn't hear a sound until I made eye contact with her. In that moment, she was my safe place. I explained to her what happened and showed her the prop. The cast was addressed, no one came forward and no one would fess up until two days and two performances later. Then due to the administration's refusal to appropriately punish the perpetrator, my mother and I filed a HIB, harassment intimidation bullying report which triggered an investigation. My friends were called into the principal and vice principal's office and were questioned. I was questioned as well, and it seemed like they were investigating me more than the person who committed the hate crime. My friends told me that they were asked questions like, did Hannah do anything to provoke this? And that shook me because whatever calls for someone writing a racial slur like that on a prop, quick answer, nothing. Under what circumstances could it have ever been appropriate for them to humiliate me in front of my cast, friends, family, and community in that manner? It was also, well, I was also called out of class numerous times and told not to make this incident my life's work by a member of the administration. Little did they know, this has been my life's work since the day I was born in this skin. Once the investigation was over, instead of the student being punished for their racist acts, they were suspended for a few days and then escorted by the principal on our Disney class trip to make sure he had a good time. That's a direct quote. Basically, the student was given time to pack and a bodyguard. The student also walked at graduation. That's when myself and my mother, who was recovering from a major surgery at the time, agreed to share my story with the media. You wouldn't have known it if you knew me back then, but growing up in this town with this skin, this hair, taught me to hate my blackness. I was taught that my blackness was less than, and I had to actively fight that narrative every day. When I went to college and I was exposed to a couple of people who looked like me, only then was I able to embrace the beauty that was this skin and this hair and this body as a whole. So here's my end question and lesson for this town. What have you learned from that incident four years ago? What did you do about the racism that was exposed? Did you brush it off and say that that was just a bad egg? Or did you actually do something proactive and meaningful. 
What are the protocols for racist acts in the school system? What is the punishment for racist acts? What resources do you offer the victims? What anti-racism resources do you offer to the perpetrators of racist acts? What did you learn? And what did you do about the injustice that you saw and heard about four years ago? Because I've lived in this town my whole life and I have stories upon stories of racist things that have happened to me here. So don't think for a second that they aren't still happening. The only reason why you believe me now is because, I, is because they got caught. Imagine if I didn't have the prop. Imagine if Breonna Taylor's body was never recovered. Imagine if there wasn't video of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. And imagine what happens when there are no cameras, bodies, witnesses, or props to be found. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, that was powerful. For those of you in the audience, there's, we're approaching 200 people and we want to again remind you that you can send questions, either general questions or questions to specific panelists to htequity at gmail.com. I'm gonna to switch to Laren if you wanna take the mic. Everybody, um, my name is Laren. Um, like Hannah, I'm also a graduate of the high school class of 2016. Um, and first off, I just want to commend everybody for everything that they've had to say so far, because everybody here is amazing. Um, so with my story, um, mine is mostly focused on the demographics of our town and like our sort of content in the school. So when I was growing up in town and I went through the school system, I saw many people around me being unaware of the weight of their thoughts and their actions, regardless of whether their intent was malicious, which is a point that Dr. Zion mentioned earlier, but that's something I want to reiterate because I think that's pretty important in a town with demographics like this one. So, you know, when I was in middle school, beginning of high school, um, racist humor was normal and around that time and something that should have never been normalized in the first place. But unfortunately, that was the social environment of the internet in the 2009-2014 era, which is something we should never go back to. Um, and you know, as I got a little bit older, you know, a lot of groups that I was around made a lot of jokes about like Hitler and Stalin and kind of just general jokes that weren't with malicious intent. We all just, and I saw it as funny too. I thought it was funny, but again, I didn't understand the full weight of the actions and the jokes and the comedy that was just not, you know, not recognized as being as harmful as it was. Um, so growing up in this town, we never really understood the re repercussions of our words and our actions because I think we hardly ever had enough peers of color to understand why what we were doing was wrong. And we hardly ever witnessed the truly hurtful things for ourselves just because that ratio was so small. And I think it's partially tied to the fact that we weren't really taught about the weight of those things in today's society. And what I mean by that is that, you know, in school we learn like about the Holocaust and we learn about slavery and segregation and the take home point is, yeah, those things were bad. So we're not gonna let it happen again, but it stops there. And I think that's a problem because we don't discuss the lasting effects that those things have on society today. So nowadays you hear a lot of people turning around going, everyone is too sensitive. And it's not that everyone is sensitive. It's just that we've been hurtful from the start and too oppressive and dismissive to be willing to hear the voices of people of color until pretty recently. And these ideas make me think about how my peers of color in school must have felt when they were treated insensitively, but felt they had to shut down any emotional reaction to it, which is still the reality today, I feel, to an extent. So moving on from high school, I went to college and unfortunately the demographics of the college I attended, Stockton University, they were pretty similar to Haddon Township. It was overwhelmingly white and I'll admit that they have been getting a lot better with that. Um, I think I've seen the ratio of white to non-white students in um, growing, which is really nice. But um, while I was there, that was where I really learned about um, how the educational and justice systems especially work against people of color. And that combined with the effect of how social media has shown me what the modern day realities are of them, something that I never learned about, something that I was never exposed to in 
you know, in my town, in my college, because of how white it really was. Um, and those realities, how they affect their lives every single day. You hear about like little instances of racist things happening here and there, and people are like, oh, you know, that's just a one-time thing. No, it's not a one-time thing. It's every day, every move people make all the time. And without social media, I would have never been aware of those things. And I helped that they've, I think that they've helped me become a much more empathetic and understanding white ally considering my background initially. Um, so yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Lynn. So now we're gonna shift focus a little bit. We've, we've heard from our, from our current students and former students now we want to shift and hear a few stories from parents of students in the system. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Karen. Hello, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, before beginning my story, I wanna explain that the, the situations that I'm going to talk about are situations that I found pre you know, prevalent and important. However, this is happening every day. Last night, my daughter came home and said, that you know, somebody had called you know her the black girl, and then the N word flies. So it's happening every day, and it's happening too often. At the same time, I feel compelled to tell you that this is pretty scary. Um, it's a scary process for all the panelists, um, and we're considering this uh, hall meeting to be a brave space. And, and and I learned that through the initiative through Collingswood and Woodland, where I work. So I want to kind of read a poem that explains what a brave space is. They usually call them safe space, but now they're going to brave space. So Mickey Scott Bay Jones wrote a poem about this. Together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as safe place. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we all have caused wounds. In this space, we, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to the to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue. We have the responsibility to examine what we think, what we know, we will not be perfect. This is not and will not be a perfect space. It, oh, sorry, but it will always be our brave space together. And we will work side by side. Um, and, and, so the world is, you know, as there is no such thing as a safe place. Um, and again, um, for those of you watching, you know, I'm, I'm going to share my stories of my family in Haddon Township and my children at this point are still in the school system. So I ask for that understanding as I tell these stories. All right. Let me get my story together here. All right, so hello, and thank you for coming this evening. My name is Kara McCoy. My family and I moved to Haddon Township around 2014. My sister lives in the area and she suggested Haddon Township, Haddon Township schools because it had the better districts in the area. So we moved to New Jersey because I was hired by the Woodland School District. And maybe I should have known then um, when people would ask me, where do you teach? And I would say Woodland and I would get the oh, I'm sorry for you. Or I would get the, hmm, those Camden kids. And I was taken back. I would quickly defend my students, my families, my administration, my colleagues. I love the families of Woodland and I wouldn't have it any other way. I get the, isn't that challenging? Well, of course it's challenging, but teaching is challenging wherever you are, especially now. So the initial move was fast. We let the older two children in North Carolina with my mother-in-law so that they could finish their school. They were junior and no, yes, sorry. They were, jun they were close to their junior year. So that left the four of us. My oldest daughter, Delaney, I asked for her permission. She said it was okay. She entered the third grade at the time and Carson entered the first grade. Van Skyver and its leadership definitely lived up to the name of being one of the best schools in the area. It was not until middle school that we realized and truly realized that Haddon Township really is a wonderful place. If 
you're an upper middle class white family. So we fit the bill economically. However, we didn't look like Haddon Township people. I go on to tell the story about before we left North Carolina and I had, we had to talk to our son. He was 17 at the time. And my husband spoke at length about staying safe and how to stay alive when he's pulled over by the police. Notice I didn't say if, but when. We did the same for our 20 year old daughter. My husband thought it was best for Sandin to stay in North Carolina because he was due for a division one scholarship. So he stayed there. He then did move back to Haddon Township to be with us. Delaney and Carson started playing sports and they were swimming for the Seahawks. Spencer was coaching whatever sport they played. And then, it, then we realized how much Haddon Township lacks in diversity. Hold on, I gotta find the place, okay. So my son came home for the summer uh, before he left to serve the military and play football for West Point. He was pulled over five to seven times within two months of moving here. When he was pulled over, he heard his father's voice in his, in his ear and did what his father taught him. There Sandin sat with his hands in clear view, looking straight ahead and asking the officer if it was okay for him to reach in his glove box to get his registration and his insurance. His license was still from North Carolina, so that prompted even further questions with the New Jersey plates. Often he had to explain to, to the police that his mom and dad live here in town and that he was staying here until he reported for our day at West Point. One officer actually asked him, your mom's a five foot white woman. He wanted to be a smart aleck, but he knew better. So he went on to explain the situation. Not that it needed explaining, I'm his mother. So have you had to talk to your son about the proper way to be pulled over? And I'm sure that you have. But was your conversation a matter of life and death? Was there a chance that your kid wouldn't come home? Would he be dead because his hand was in the wrong spot or on his cell phone? When we refer to the white privilege, it sounds as though white people, including myself, have found it a simple def oh, ha have done something wrong. The best def definition of white privilege that I find is simple. White privilege does not mean that your life has not been hard or full of tough times. It simply means that your skin color was not something to add to that. The more we realized that our family was rare in this area, the more we spoke to our young daughters. We told them that the people would say stuff about their race. They were both young and at the time. Oh, and we told them that people just wouldn't appreciate their beautiful brown skin. My daughters were quickly placed in the black student category, not by choice, but because it's where more people were comfortable with them being. So they became the McCoy black girls. Racism is not only being seen in the school, it's everywhere. And before you say, oh, no, 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 it's not, because I get that a lot. The fact that you're white, you don't experience the constant whispers, the use of the N-word, and all of these microaggressions that go on. Delaney and I go to the store often, and people always ask her, are you two together or is this separate? And she always answers, that's my mom. So as Delaney gets older and her experiences are changing quickly, anyone that knows Delaney knows that she is a beautiful, curly head, genuine young person. She always finds the best in everything and everyone. She's always been unique and unwavered by the real world. She went along, oh, sorry. Doo -doo -doo, I lost my spot. Doo -doo -doo. All right, until we hit the eighth grade, that was the first time that my daughter had to deal with the microaggressions. This is a word that we keep throwing around. Um, I decided to research microaggressions. And again, the definition that I found most useful was the unintentional race, racial bias that people have towards people of color. So her friends started using the N-word and she went along with it because she thought she was supposed to. She came home and talked to her father and I when we explained that it's not okay or funny. We told her that it devalued her as a brown person. There were other incidents that we talked about at the dinner table. Yes, we sit at the dinner table. To help her understand that the use of the N-word was not okay. She entered high school 
and we could tell that Delaney was developing as a person and she was falling in love with the little brown girl she saw in the mirror. Still, the uncertainty of where she belonged was a struggle. The next conversation we had with Delaney is when she came home and burst into tears and we asked her what's wrong. She said, I don't get it. Why are the black girls at school telling me I sound white? We took the time to sit her down and explain that she came from a home and family of two educated parents and you don't sound white, you sound educated. The next event happened in the hallway when another white student slammed her into the locker and said, move slave. Laney came home again and the situation came up at dinner. Naturally, Spencer and I were disgusted. So Laney went to administration, which she thought would be her brave space. And the result of her conversation was pretty much the same as Hannah's. You wanna make sure that somebody said that before we accuse somebody of being a racist. We wouldn't want that to happen. So she didn't have a brave space. Laney, like Hannah, is a lover of the theater. She wanted to audition. She was told by a number of peers that she could not audition for certain characters because they're white and can't be portrayed by a black girl. We've let our kids handle the situations. We've told them that we'll step in when the time is necessary. And I don't know that Lainey will ever go to what she thought was her safe space again to report things that go on. And then the family, if we bring it to school, we become, uh, they're pulling the race card. Let's not forget that Lainey's friends call her a cotton picker and she laughs because it makes her feel better to not make up a, a problem. And let's not forget the little boy that Lainey liked and, and he referred to her and he said, you know, you'd be prettier if you were white. Lainey's having to defend her color and her friends are not. Again, white privilege. My youngest daughter is coming into her own. However, middle school has been miserable for her. She's tried to fill, she has tried to fit in with many groups of friends and she always returns to the friends she knows are true. It's the idea that she doesn't know where she belongs. She's been placed in this black category because that's where Hatton Township wants her. All she's ever wanted, long, straight, blonde hair, a Barbie doll to braid. We put her hair in puffs for years. They were the cutest, my family loves them. Carson's hair has always been a subject of contention. I remember she was going to get her hair done after school, so we pulled the braids out and put it in a puff. Sorry. She was happy. We got her to be okay with it. And then a young boy in the back said, I can't see over Carson's crazy hair. So Carson doesn't express herself the same way that Delaney does. So she's lucky she's got Delaney to go to. So she kept it in and eventually she ended up telling her, the lady that does her hair, Brandy, who then told me, I was in tears. Here is this beautiful young girl with beautiful skin and she's not comfortable in it. Carson would say her stomach hurt if her hair was out. She'd put her hands on her head to cover it so people couldn't see it. She could not understand why people wanted to touch her hair and say things. <clears throat> it was not until her seventh grade year during remote learning that she started to embrace her hair. She watched YouTube videos and taught herself how to do her own hair. Sometimes after getting her hair done, she'd have a really bad headache. And I, I told her that, oh, I gave her two Tylenol and told her if her head hurts to go to the nurse. So she told the teacher that my mom told me to go to the nurse if my head hurts. Sorry, my phone. My mom told me to go to the nurse if my head hurts. And the teacher told me, no, mommy, I did what you told me to do. And Carson continued to have to answer questions about her eyes. You can't be black. Black people don't have green eyes. Your eyes are fake. Again, a beautiful, young, brown girl feels unvalidated and defensive because she is asked to explain herself when none of her white friends have to defend their hair or their eye, or their eye color. She's internalizing and she's not sharing. She doesn't feel validated. Her seventh grade year was the worst by far. Her constant desire to know and love who she was in her own skin, her own hair, and her own eyes resulted in a pretty bad case of depression. It was pretty deep that my husband and I sought professional help for her and checked on her often, hoping that she was just still in there alive. We taught, we communicated with the school. They helped as much as they could, but 
didn't know how severe it was. Assignments came piled on. They continued to pile on. She got less and less interested and decided, I'm just not going to do it. Carson just wanted to be Carson, and she hasn't figured out who that is yet. So Spencer and I, we built a home in which our children are free to be who they are. Our goal is for them to embrace themselves and everything about them. Another lesson that I learned is a person's perception is a person's truth. So therefore, if our Brown students perceive that Haddon Township's not a safe or brave place for them, and it's reaffirmed daily through the community in which they live, that perception becomes the Brown person's truth. Thank you. Thank you. That was a powerful stories to share. I'm going to switch to our next parent, and that is Dory. Hello, my name is Dory Fields. I have resided in Haddon Township for 23 years. I'd like to offer a special thanks to HTEI and Dr. Zion for the opportunity to participate on the panel this evening. It offered me the opportunity to reflect as a parent on the 13 years my daughter spent in the Haddon Township school system. This discussion is particularly timely as July is by POC, Black Indigenous People of Color Mental Health Month in honor of B.B. Moore Campbell, best-selling author and journalist. Mental Health America produces a toolkit each year at this time and offered the following insight. People of color and all those whose lives have been marginalized by those in power experience life differently from those whose lives have not been devalued. They experience overt racism and bigotry far too often, which leads to a mental health burden that is deeper than what others may face. Racism is a mental health issue because racism causes trauma and trauma paints a direct line to mental illnesses which need to be taken seriously. Every day, as Liren said, people of color experience far more subtle traumas. People who avoid them in their neighborhoods out of ignorance and fear banks and credit companies who won't lend them money or do so only at higher interest rates, mass incarceration of their peers, school curricula that ignore or minimize their contributions to our shared history and racial profiling to name a few. When my daughter was in second grade, I suspected that she had a learning disability. In hindsight, I was disappointed that Rather than the district be immediately helpful and partner with me to ensure that my child received the best education possible, I was met with resistance. For example, I was told that I had to jump through a lot of hoops to qualify her for testing. So I paid thousands of dollars to have her tested privately and for recommended therapies. Once test results showed a learning disability, I was then given the runaround by the district. One example of that, I was told that the school therapist could not meet on any of the days that my hired advocate could meet to negotiate Hannah's initial IEP. So my advocate arranged to attend by telephone. On the day of the meeting when I arrived, I went around the table and shook everyone's hand, except that of Hannah's teacher who refused. As I approached her, she wrapped both of her hands around her coffee mug in avoidance. When I inquired if my advocate was on the line, the response was, we are very time constrained and have other meetings, so we cannot wait for her. So after the meeting, I called her and discovered that she called on time, but was placed on hold for the entire hour and was never put through to the conference room. So I ended up self-advocating for Hannah's IEP while paying $500 for the advocate to be on hold. And by the way, the therapist never showed up to the meeting because I was told she couldn't get a babysitter for her two small children, although I was there on my lunch hour. 
I continued paying privately throughout my daughter's education for tutors, only to discover later that by law, many of the accommodations I paid for should have been provided by the school district. In contrast, when Hannah was a freshman in college, I met with my personal attorney, who happens to be white, on a private matter. And during our catch up, I discovered that his son also went through the Haddon Township school system. And he described that his privileged child, who had a similar disability, was afforded every possible accommodation and that the district bent over backwards, in quotes, to assure that he was provided the best experience and education. When I shared a little of our experience with him, he said, I wish you would have reached out to me so that I could have assured the same for Hannah, that she would have the same experience as my son. Looking back, my experience in dealing with HT administration felt like rolling a boulder up a mountain. But in spite of all of that, my amazing daughter mainstreamed herself by high school, earned awards and scholarships for her character, skills, and talents, including the coveted H Pin Award, and built a reputation for bringing sunshine into every room she entered. She is now a graduate with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from a private university. Imagine how much more she could have achieved if she had the same support from the district. At the end of the day, these children are our future. Any investment we make in their education, self-respect and respect for others or anything we do to deprive them of it will impact our future as a country and world. So let's strive to work together to offer them the best education possible in the best environment possible. Thank you for allowing me to share my experience. Thank you, Dory. So I want to remind you once again, viewers, that if you have questions for any of the panelists or just general larger questions, please email them to htequity at gmail.com. And we're going to move now to our final two panelists who are both educators in the district. So the first one is going to be Jesus. Hi, folks. My name is Jesus. I'm the incoming woodworking teacher wood shop teacher beginning this fall at Haddon Township. It's not started yet. But my wife and I moved into a cute little bungalow right off the Newton Creek back in 2015, which as a wooden boat builder has been the dream. I'm from Mexico City originally. I grew up in Gainesville, Georgia, Los Angeles, California, and Fort Worth, Texas. I had one Mexican elementary school teacher one Asian middle school math teacher, and one black high school football coach. 30 teachers and coaches from pre-K through 12th grade, and three were non-white. Does it matter? To me, it did. Childhood, and especially adolescence, revolves tightly around identity development. My school has asked us to build towards and focus on what we wanted to do with our future. Hit the science books hard to prepare for your pre-med program, future doctor. Memorize the masterpieces of the bard for your theater auditions, future actor. Master the trigonometric functions to understand the complex mechanics of our designed world, future engineer. I worked hard to learn the things that I needed to learn in order to do the things that I wanted to do. But the underlying lesson that I internalized from these brilliant, inspiring, white faces guiding me towards my destiny was that most of all, I wanted to grow up to be like them. I wanted to grow up to be white. In my early 20s, I might have been pretty certain that I had. I was coaching football. I was starting to make my way in the traditional wooden boat building world with an academic education from a conservative university and a craft education from a little seaside institution in Northern Maine. And I played, sang, and even wrote a couple of country songs. See, I assumed that these traits I was earning were capable of disguising my brownness. Instead, I was becoming an exception to my brownness an asterisk. In an attempt to unother myself, 
I become exponentially more other and comfortable in neither of my skins. The concept is assimilation, taking on the traits of the dominant culture to such a degree that the assimilating group becomes socially indistinguishable from the dominant members of the society. That's what I was working on. I'm an assimilated Mexican American who after a decade of hard work and still and forever will be working on understanding how I feel about the skin into which I was born. Now about two years ago here in Haddon Township, I had my most recent encounter with overt aggressive racism, an all out assault on my assimilation. I was out for an early morning run, came up to one of our big four-way intersections and I stopped. After the signal changed, I trotted out into the street and an SUV with two white men came whipping around the corner, maybe two feet from my large brown, easily visible body. As they passed me, the driver had his window down. He pounded on the side of his car and yelled, I go first, Beaner. Then the passenger joined in on the other side, pounding his car and just yelled, Beaner, three or four times as they flew down the White Horse Pike. Had I not already begun the process of understanding myself, I can't imagine what kind of identity crisis I would have suffered at that moment. Instead, that moment catalyzed a need in me to better understand and work to absolutely dismantle the racism in our community. I'm thrilled to take that anti-racist effort into my work at the school. I will be intentional about my brownness on campus and in the classroom. I will celebrate my Latino heritage alongside the 11% Latinx student body of Haddon Township High School. I will, when necessary, work to amplify non-white teacher, student, and curricular voices. I will recognize the boundless individuality of each one of my students. I'll humbly support student-led anti-racist initiatives. I will teach culturally diverse woodworking practices, including Japanese reverence for the soul of a tree, the Scandinavian spirit of warm minimalism, the North African 4,000 year old development of our most fundamental woodworking joint, the Latin American rambunctious contribution to the mid-century modern movement, and the work of Caesar Cheller, a slave freed only upon his master's death, who became one of the three most influential American hand tool makers to date. I'm going to teach all these things with awareness towards gender bias, sexism, and racism across the skilled trades. And I will support and provide resources for self-advocacy for all of those students who will transition further into a society that is biased against them. I hope that hearing our stories tonight turns up the volume on our minority narrative just loud enough to be an equal part of this community conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Um, last and definitely not least in this list of amazing, amazing panelists is Barbara. Hi everyone, I'm Barb Matthews Bowen. I'm a teacher at Penn Township High School. Penn Township is often described as a family. In fact, in a recent survey of faculty by our incoming superintendent, the word family often was used by respondents as a positive attribute. But as you know, in every family, there are favorite and not so favorite children, in-laws, step relatives, cousins we'd rather not talk about. Family can be supportive and nourishing. Family can also be insular and closed-minded. I moved to Haddon Township 28 years ago, raised my children here, have worked in the schools for the past 17 years, and still feel to some extent like an outsider. I'm not Catholic. I'm not Irish. I'm not Italian. 
I've never summered down the shore. I worked outside the home during a time when most of my children's mothers did not. I didn't attend the school at which I teach. For me, the feeling of not belonging that this has engendered has occasionally been a cause of sadness and frustration. And yet, my experience as a white, educated, heterosexual with a fairly respectable job can't begin to compare to the experience of our students and residents who are Black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, non-native English speakers, differently abled, or immigrants. Easy for me to pass as a Haddon Township native. Not easy at all for them. As someone who grew up in the South in the 1960s, talking and thinking about race is nothing new. I went to high school in the district that spawned the Supreme Court decision upholding busing to desegregate public schools the very year they were desegregated. I was my school representative at conferences aimed at easing the transition as students from, a formerly, all, from formerly all black schools began to matriculate to my formerly all white school. There were tensions that several times spilled over into what some considered riots. These early experiences certainly made me feel that I was sensitive to racial issues, even though they didn't affect me directly. In college, I studied political science and journalism using the lessons I learned from my younger years to try to address the continuing problems of racial and class inequality, but always from a distance. Writing about things isn't the same as experiencing them. A lesson I learned all too clearly while working at the Philadelphia Inquirer. At the Inquirer, I had black friends and colleagues who had grown up in Philadelphia during the Rizzo years. They described their experiences and their parents' experiences in vivid terms. It was in these discussions with them that I first heard the expression driving while black. I felt that I understood all they had gone through until October 3rd, 1995. On that day, my colleagues gathered around the newsroom television to watch the announcement of the verdict in the OJ Simpson murder trial. My white colleagues and I were horrified at the acquittal. Our black colleagues saw it as long overdue acknowledgement that there are profound disparities in the criminal justice system. That was when I realized that I didn't understand the experiences of black people at all because I am not one. I was never sat down by my parents to discuss how to behave in the presence of police. I've certainly never been stopped for driving while white. I've never been followed at a convenience store because I look suspicious. I've never been told by a principal that she's keeping an eye on me because I transferred in from Camden. I've never had anyone throw a racial epithet at me. I don't know what it's like to sit in my class and see no one else who looks like me. I don't know what it's like to go to school for 12 years and never be taught by a teacher of my own racial identity. Oftentimes, I'm struck during class discussions by the realization that many of my students believe the movement for civil rights began and ended in the early to mid 1960s, that it's a done deal, that MLK's I have a dream speech solved it all. I fear that some during this period will respond to the moment in this moment in time by merely adding discrete units to the educational curriculum, providing only a way to check the box with what seems like an easy fix and move on. We're good. We have character education in our advisory class. We're reading Langston Hughes. We study the slave trade. Of course, we need all these things, but there is no easy fix. We need to incorporate awareness of inequalities and inequities in every class, in every interaction with every student. We can no longer check the box and move on. In the wake of George Floyd's murder, I am realizing that what I have thought of as my empathy for students of color is falling way short. I need to understand more and talk much less. I need to accept that I have benefited from privilege my entire life, even when it doesn't feel that way. I need to overcome my innate desire not to make waves, including my fear that what I've said tonight will offend some. I need to use a limited understanding of being an outsider to create a safe space, a brave space, for students who know all too well what exclusion feels like. I need to actually act on my beliefs. I know I can't call myself a white ally. I will need to earn that designation. I am here tonight to hear and to learn, and I humbly thank you all for this opportunity. So I don't 
don't know about y'all watching, but I'm feeling a little bit shivery, and I do this for a living. Um, that was some powerful stories, a broad, broad range of stories. And um, I just really thank you for being willing to step up and share them and be so powerful in the way that you conveyed um, those messages. So we have about 15 minutes here where we're going to try to take a few questions and answer a few questions. Um, I'm going to, I have a half a dozen, I think, so far. The first one is, I just, I think we need a yes or no question. And I think this is a Hannah question, maybe. Um, but yes or no, don't name names. Um, the question is, is the administrator that was involved in your situation still in the district? I will not name names, never. Um, yes, they are. Okay. And I think not that naming names is necessarily a bad thing. I would hope that maybe we are creating a space where there could be an opportunity to repair and restore. We just don't want to do it in a way that furthers ugliness, right? Not, not you know, publicly like this. Let's right. Give them some notice. <laughs> but the invitation is there for them to step up and engage the dialogue. Yes. Okay. Um. Then I think I have a question here. It's, it's less of a question and more of a comment, but if someone on the panel wanted to address it, um, I, I would think we could be open to that. The question says, there is bias against those who do not live in Haddon Township proper. Children from the extension and the heights are constantly put down for not being part of town. Coincidentally, many of the families in the extension and the heights are minorities. So um, maybe if just one person here who has some context behind that wanted to mention, say something about that. Go ahead, Anna, since you're there. Um, that, it, yes, that's very true. There is, um, even from school to school, there are kids that say, oh, you're from this school? Oh, like it's, it's everywhere. That, that is, um, that's something that, that yeah, it's true. It, that, that's a huge part of um, of the the geographical bias. <laughs> okay. So in addition to all of the other, the, there are so many ways that we marginalize each other, and I think to me it's the important part of engaging in the beginning in this anti-racist work is that if we can build our individual capacity, our critical consciousness around the ways that we as human beings marginalize and sort and privilege and oppress, then that set of skills is transferable from race conversations to class conversations, to gender conversations, to sexuality and religion and ideology and all of the other ways that we sort and marginalize each other. So the next question here, and maybe this is for one of our educators, either Jesus or Barb. The question is, how can we educate our children to be anti-racist and support those who receive pushback from their families and friends. I've got a fly in here. It's not me just losing my mind. I guess the best, well, that's a, that is a tough, tough question. Right? Um, if it was easy, I would have answered it. I would say if you're asking that question, whoever is asking that question, you are teaching your children to be anti-racist because you want your children to be anti-racist. And I'm hoping that's the case. Um, I think in in the classroom, in the schools, it falls on us to make sure that we do not tolerate racist behavior, language, or sexist, or religionist, or any of those other things, and uh, let children know that we are there to, to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to piggyback off of that, Dory was talking about trauma. And if I remember correctly, the research points to the trauma really being able to be subverted a bit by having a real ally that the student can go to. Um, so while we're working on eliminating the racism, just being that honest, earnest presence that a young person can bring their experience too, I think makes a huge difference. Okay. So I have a couple questions that came in earlier via the Google Docs. And so I'm going to get to those and then another one that just came in via the email. Um, this is a question for 
I think probably one of the current students, so either Jaden or Maya or Matt, the, it's from a person who was an 84 graduate of Haddon Township um, who was Asian Indian and felt left out. The question is, are students of color accepted by their white peers? Have race relations improved in the years since this person graduated in 1984? Jaden or Maya or Matt? I'll go. Um, I'll have to say not really. Like I mentioned in my thing before, if you kind of accept yourself, you're then just put into a group with all the other black kids. It's not really like, oh, everyone's friends with everyone. Luckily, I was able to make great friends who didn't do that to me, but I see a lot of kids and people and students who that does happen to. Okay. And I just want to add, so I, I think there is maybe less overt racism in terms of, but I think that we have, a, I think there's a, a clear separation that uh, kind of shows up between, like, as much as we try not to, we have African Americans in one section and they're kind of not, they're, they're separate. They, there is a separate group and I, I don't know how to fix that, but it is something we still have in our town, I think. Okay. This is another question for, um, it looks like the current students. Um, and so maybe Maya, you wanna take this one as a starting point and then someone else could jump in. The question is in what ways, no, have you talked with your parents, friends, siblings or other close family members about race? And what are some of these things about these conversations that stand out to you? So like when you try to raise these topics about race with friends or family, what happens? And let's have Maya and maybe Matt talk about that. Um, well, when I bring it up with my family, like I don't really have any racist family members and like all my family members support the Black Lives Matter movement. But I think definitely among my friends, um, it's kind of something they don't want to talk about sometimes or it's like it ha kind of has to go into like political opinions, which it shouldn't, but that's how it is. So it's something that my friend group like doesn't really want to talk about. And I'll just say, so there are, uh, the conversations about race that I've had are kind of split into two groups. There is those that I have with like, with uh, we'll call them the adults, like the older, the older generations, right? And what stands out to me of those is how much they know how much they are kind of just aware of things that happen. Like for instance, before I was, you know, before I understood what, uh, like Ms. Matthew Bowen said, uh, like driving while black, before I understood what that meant, um, or rather when I found out, I talked about it with them and they knew it existed. It was just kind of like something they said, yep, it, it, that's a thing. But then the other, uh, the opposite of the spectrum is um, with people who are my own age. And a lot of the time they don't understand what that means you say that and they'll be like, and they'll, they'll look at you with a blank stare and, and they'll not understand. So I think that what kind of stands out to me is, is the disparity in how much we know and how much we're willing to accept that it is just a thing or that we are unaware and that's okay. Um, I would also like to add that like just before this meeting started, my mom went outside and there was a man making a comment about the Black Lives Matter um, poster on our front lawn and he was telling his daughter that it was un-American. And so it kind of just makes this, me realize that like, that it really is like adults rubbing off on their children because she's probably gonna listen to her dad. Absolutely. Okay. So this is a question that maybe I would like to see if the, um, one of the parents wants to take up. It's a question of how do you see race or other isms playing out in the school curriculum or school level opportunities for students. So thinking back to the, or thinking about the curriculum that your students experience. Dory or Karen. I can go. Um, so I, I feel like it needs to be, you know, taught as a whole subject, you know, we're, if, and we've discussed this over at our school in Woodland, you know, if, if you're in elementary school and you're teaching about the American Revolution or you're teaching about something in history, the only viewpoint we're getting is that of the, as they say, white supremacist um, beings that actually made America, America. 
So what were the Indians thinking? You know, let's take it from a different point of view. Let's address, let's um, make sure that we're intertwining whoever was around at that time, not just the colonists, but let's talk about those Indians. Let's, let's see what they're doing and how, how would you feel if you were an Indian during that time? You know, so there's, there's simple ways to put it in there. And then there's obviously the harder ways, which is having, you know, um, in high school requiring perhaps um, a class on, I learned this too. We don't want to call them minorities because there's nothing minor about any of them. <laughs> um, but maybe have some studies within the high school where kids can really get into it and talk and have conversation. Um, I was um, a little over the remote learning. Um, a book came home with Carson and it was called Decay. And it's a very racially driven book. And I, at that time I was like, well, you can't just send this home without a place for her to talk about and be a part of and, and share what it was because it's a very much a book on race. So we have to get people comfortable with conversations like that. Um, and we have to we have to be okay finding out what the other ethnicities that were there at that time in history were. Now you can I guess you can make it the curriculum. You can you know demand a a study of of brown people or, or whatever works for your curriculum. But I, I mean it definitely needs to be there. It's not like we we were all there. It's, you know. Um, and I don't know why, why it's not, why we don't do that or why we haven't done that. You know, when learning about something, Brown students aren't connecting with, you know, the whole, the whole reason they connected with the Hamilton play is because the actors and actresses look like them in the, it, like them, you know, um, but if that was an all white cast, it wouldn't have been as successful to most people. Okay. So I, I think it's necessary and I think it needs to be intertwined, not really in isolation because not, none of it really happened in isolation. There's people everywhere, so. I would like to chime Definitely. in if that's okay. Um, you know, uh, I happened to watch uh, the conversation, Dr. Zion, that you had with the Haddonfield School District. And there was a very sharp young lady on there that spoke to the curricula, uh, that there are actual charters that, that demand that the school systems teach from elementary school through middle school and high school um, a, a richer, truer history. Um, and I wish I knew the names of those charters. I was very impressed with this young lady, but uh, the point that she made is that if we wanna hold ourselves up as a, uh, as a valuable education, then we ought to be teaching the truth. A lot of our history has been whitewashed, if you'll excuse the phrase, and uh, a lot of our history is just plain a lie. And so um, I think that the young people who I'm so impressed with in their movement toward wanting to know their true history um, should fight for with our support, um, gaining the best education, which would be the truth from elementary school through their high school education. And I just wanted to speak to the person who asked about anti-racist literature. And I would say to that, just like every uh, thing else that we like to research, you can Google the bestseller list for anti-racist literature. It's plentiful. And if your children are old enough to watch the movie 13th, watch it first, and they will get a true education about our history. And it will open their minds to understand the struggles of people of color, so that they can be more compassionate and intelligent about what racism is and how not to be racist. But it, I agree with the teacher, Jesus, that if you are concerned about it, then your children are not being taught to be racist because to be racist means to have power, first of all, to oppress another person, to stop them I'm from living Bowen. their life. Oh, I'm sorry, Hannah corrected me. It was Ms. Bowen that, that made the comment. But, uh, so I have the same issues as the other Dory the fish. <laughs> I can't remember. Also, Amazon <laughs> Amazon has uh, anti-racism books. There's a whole list for little kids and for 
older, you know, adults. So yeah, there's that. <laughs> awesome. So we are at a point where I want to, we're going to, we're going to wrap this part of the questions up. There are three or four more questions that I say that I'm going to turn over to the committee to take up and figure out how to communicate some responses to. I think we could get some deeper responses to all of these. Um, one of them was about how we're going to spread this message to kids in the school. One was about, um, you know, how do we take on this deeply embedded institutionalized issue? Um, it's a really big, beautiful question and a lot shorter, a lot longer than what I just gave it its due. We have a question from a viewer that's about what do we do to support our neighbors in our community when sometimes the police officers and other, you know, township leaders, not just in the school, are not um, responding in ways that are protecting and helping. And then we have a question about how to avoid traumatizing black and brown students, students of color, when we're having conversations about race, when white teachers are trying to talk about this in ways with largely white classrooms. So those are questions that we're either going to we'll use to frame either another town hall or we'll figure out a way to respond to just because of timing right now. The way that we had planned to wrap this up, and I think that they may actually get to the answering some of these questions, is that I'm gonna invite each of our panelists to complete a sentence for me. And the sentence starter, for those of you who would identify as allies, is a, I wish I knew. And for those of you who identify as Black or Indigenous or people of color, I wish you knew, right? So we're, we're centering that experience and asking allies to talk about something I wish I knew and for people of color, something I wish that the white people knew. So I wanna start that with Jaden. Hi, I wish you knew how out of place and uncomfortable in my own skin you made me feel. Thank you. Maya? I wish I knew how to be the best friend to colored people that I can be. Matt. I wish I knew how important it was to see yourself and the people around you, how much I've benefited from that and that many other students can't. Karen. This comes from um, my daughter. So it's, um, I wish you knew that I laugh at the racial jokes to make you feel comfortable. I wish you knew that I devalue who I am in every situation to make it more comfortable for you. I wish you know how disrespectful it is when you use the N-word with the hard R. I wish you knew that because, sorry. I wish you knew that because I was trying so hard to make you comfortable, I lost myself. I wish you knew that my skin color is not going to hurt you. And finally, we wish we knew why my skin color scares you. All right, Dory. I wish you knew the anxiety I felt every time I had to attend an IEP meeting year after year because it was built on a foundation of mistrust. Jesus. I wish you knew what it feels like to wear a skin color that in one glance identifies you as other to many and less than to some without any way of knowing who thinks what. Barbara. I wish I knew how to create a brave space in our schools to empower our students of color to advocate for themselves so that I can understand better how to be an effective advocate for them. Hannah. I wish you knew the pain behind my smile. I wish you knew how you taught me to hate my curls, my hips, my melanin skin that I was born in. I wish you knew how hard it was to get up every day in a place that hated or simply tolerated my existence, strictly based on the color of my skin. Oh, how I wish you knew the pain behind my smile. Thank you. So I'm going to just say a sentence or two to kind of sum this up, and then I'm going to turn it over to the committee to close this out and maybe talk about next steps. The thing that stands out to me in this conversation is that 
my assumption is that most of the people on this call are not people who engage intentionally or actively in racist behavior. And that underscores what I think the real problem is, that it's less in what we do and more in what we don't do. That is the challenge of privilege, st to step up, to take action, even and especially on issues and at times that have no direct impact on us individually. It's a commitment to challenging systems that benefit us while harming others. It's about listening and learning and unlearning. It's about repairing, restoring, and reimagining. We've started tonight to create the space for that. And that leaves me with a question for you, the question that you have to grapple with, the question for each of you individually to make a commitment to what you will do. There's a slide, I think, from the team. It's coming. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, here on our screen, we have a slide that outlines some next steps. Um, please look uh, forward to some upcoming events. We have a rally for justice. There's an upcoming board of ed meeting and a town hall and join us online at the addresses listed below. Um, and hopefully uh, listening to these heartfelt stories and people sharing their most challenging experiences will drive us all into action. Um, here at Haddon Township Equity Initiative, our belief is that when we learn something, we'll do something. And thank you and have a good night. All right. Thank you okay. all panelists. That was really beautiful and powerful. Woo!